Uh, so in the last class, uh, we have uh, discussed about uh, two uh, important attributes uh, of uh, in a digital communication system. Uh, one was uh, the efficiency and the second one was the reliability. So as I've already mentioned, uh, the digital information that you are uh, going to transmit over the, over the channel, this has to be accomplished uh, in an efficient way. Why? Because there are certain uh, resources for any communication system and uh, already we have mentioned uh, these resources one was the bandwidth and the second one was the power so whenever any communication is set up between the transmitter and the receiver uh, so we have to establish that particular uh, communication setup in such a way that the power and the bandwidth can be used or can be utilized efficiently that means uh, let, let me first uh, write down the Two different resources one is the power and the second one is the bandwidth so you have to utilize these two resources in an efficient manner so that your ultimate goal is not at all hampered your ultimate goal is to allow the signal to get transmitted from the transmitter side to the receiver side with minimum error so that is your goal that you have a transmitter, you have a receiver, and in between that, you have a channel. Now, whenever you are sending the information in terms of zeros and ones in a digital communication environment, so ultimately at the receiving end, you are going to receive those information. Now, whether uh, the corresponding communication has been established with minimum error or not, that can be uh, guaranteed by observing the beat error rate or BER in short. Which I've already mentioned. Uh, this is nothing but the number of bits in error. Number of bits in error upon the total number of bits that you observed. Total number of bits. So, for practical consideration, the BR value should be as low as like say 10 to the power minus 10 to 10 to the minus 11. But even for uh, minus n to minus 11, but even for a simulation purpose uh, for the research study, we prefer any value of BR less than 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 7 can be acceptable. So you have to ensure that this amount of BR is achievable with your communication environment. Now, to achieve this BR, one uh, obvious uh, option that is available to you is to increase the signal power. Because if the signal power is more as compared to the noise power, then obviously the SNR uh, will be high. And as a matter of fact, the BER value will be very small. Because you don't have any control over the noise power. Because this is the property of the channel itself. You cannot control the noise power. So what you can do, you can only increase the signal power. But uh, if you go on increasing the signal power indefinitely, then what happens? The power efficiency of the system is going to hamper. So you cannot increase the signal power at per your wish. Rather, there should be a certain a threshold, there should be certain benchmark. Over and above, you cannot use the signal power, in which case the, your, your system will become a power inefficient system. So uh, you have to uh, use the power, uh, the available power in an efficient manner so that the BER is at, at an acceptable rate. On the other hand, as far as the bandwidth is concerned, uh, as you know, if you are allowed infinite bandwidth practically, to you. So in that case, there will be no uh, question of ISI, as we have already discussed in the last one. So if you have infinite bandwidth available to you, then there is no uh, question of ISI, no intersymbol interference. But practically, whenever a communication is set up between the transmitter and receiver, the available channel bandwidth is, is finite. Might be few megahertz or kilohertz or few gigahertz, depending upon the application but this is not infinite right so therefore uh, for a finite bandwidth there will be a situation of uh, intersymbol interference and that can also result in some bits in error so ultimately it can degrade the br performance of finite bandwidth so you cannot use infinite bandwidth so once again there should be some trade off between the br and the bandwidth so this is all about the efficient uh, utilization of your resources so you have to utilize your resource properly 
so that or efficiently so that the communication or the required specification is attained now last day we have uh, talked about the information so uh, already uh, these two uh, terms are not equivalent one is the data or event and the second one is information as you all know from the last day's discussion that the information and the data these two things are not the same for example if i consider a uh, a source symbol like this say we have a we have a source like this and which can emit say symbols from a set say curly s so there could have been say k number of possible alphabets like say s1 s2 up to say sk with a corresponding probability like p1 p2 up to pk now the information conveyed by each of them are not the same already in the last class we have mentioned that the information contained within any particular symbol is inversely proportional to the probability of occurrence in other words the information pertaining to any any arbitrary symbol si can be represented as log 2 base 1 upon pi and the unit is bit so if pi is high pi is more then obviously the corresponding information content is less and vice versa in an extreme case when pi is equal to 1 then the information content will become zero so whenever the symbols of so, uh, each of the symbols and they have a corresponding value of uh, a probability associated with them so let me identify s1 is uh, transmitted with the probability of p1 s2 with the probability of p2 and up to say sk is with the probability of pk for example now right at the moment i am assuming that this uh, symbols are not equiprobable that means p1 is not equal to p2 is not equal to pk so all these values are different but the total summation must be equal to 1 as you know if i just uh, find it out this one summation over pi for all i i is equal to 1 to k this will give you 1 this is true as you understand from the notion of probability so one of the means to uh, use the available uh, power and the available bandwidth i mean the available resources in an efficient way is to encode the corresponding symbols in such a way that the symbols for which the information content is large they are accompanied with more number of bits so already uh, we have uh, so i think uh, it will be better if i write it down for efficient transmission for efficient transmission symbol so this s1 s2 s3 so these are the symbols symbols with higher probability so higher probability means what lower information content so lower information content so symbols with higher probability or lower information content so the symbols are represented so these symbols are represented with fewer bits and vice versa that means if any particular symbol is having a very low value of probability which means that the corresponding information content is very much large so in that case it can be represented with more number of bits and vice versa so for efficient transmission the symbols with higher probability they are represented with fewer number of bits so the symbols which are having a lower information content that means 
they will occur frequently because their probability of occurrence is very large. Symbols with higher probability. What does it mean? They occur frequently. So if the symbols occur frequently, then they are represented with fewer number of bits. And on the other hand, if the symbols which occur with a lower probability, which occur rarely, so for those symbols, the corresponding bits are much more. Now, for example, if I consider the English alphabet, for example, so let us assume that uh, the source, uh, this particular source under consideration, is generating the alphabets from the English literature. So this curly S consists of all those 26 different alphabets, A to Z. Now, if you uh, consider any paragraph or any story written in Eng English language, you will find that the letter E is having the highest probability. Might be the highest probability is associated with the alphabet E. So it is accompanied with highest P. And on the other hand, if I consider the word Q, so the corresponding probability is, is the minimum. So let us try to identify the symbol which is having the highest probability of occurrence and another symbol which is having the lowest probability of occurrence. So from your understanding, you must appreciate that E is that particular alphabet which is having the highest probability of occurrence. So if you have, say, thousand such uh, letters in any particular paragraph, then you will find that the E is appearing, say, say 10% or, or say 15% out of this thousand. So, I mean, it will be 100 or 150 times out of these 100 letters. And on the other hand, the uh, occurrence of Q is uh, significantly small. Say, out of thousand, say, you can find, say, max to max, say, 5 or 10. So it's very small, 0 0.015 or 0 0.010. So uh, from this discussion, uh, we can understand that E occurs frequently and Q occurs rarely. So as far as our understanding information uh, theory is concerned, so we may connect this particular behavior of the English letters in a way that the letter E is having lower information content. And on the other hand, the letter Q is having very higher information content. So therefore, the symbol which is having a lower information content, so they are represented with fewer bits. And on the other hand, the letter which is having the higher information content, they are represented by more number of bits. Now, the same analogy has been uh, utilized in Morse code. Uh, so I don't know whether you have any knowledge about Morse code or not. In Morse code, all the alphanumeric characters like uh, 0 to uh, 9 and uh, A to Z, so all those characters is alphanumeric characters, so they are represented by dash and dot. So just like a binary kind of thing, so instead of uh, representing them by 0 or 1, uh, th there are two different uh, symbols, one was dash and the second one was dot. So using these two symbols, all the alphanumeric characters are being represented. Now for E, since it is having the highest probability, so therefore, so E is represented by a single dot, by a single dot. So only one particular character over there for E. And on the other hand, the Q, which is having the lowest probability, this has been represented by four such characters, dash, dash, dot, dash. So it signifies that the number of characters associated with any particular symbol is proportional to the information content. So if the information content is more, then the number of bits associated with that will be more. And if the information content is less, in that case, the corresponding number of bits associated with the particular symbol will be less. So if I have the symbols like this, S1 with a probability say P1, S2 with a probability say P2, S3, with the probability say P3 and so on. And suppose the last symbol is SK with the probability of PK. You can easily identify the corresponding information content. And suppose the corresponding, so these are the symbols. 
Suppose this S1 is being represented by L1 number of bits, S2 is being represented by L2 number of bits, S3 is being represented by L3 number of bits, and so on. And ultimately, we have for SK, there are LK number of bits. So, if I consider the average, so for each of this uh, particular symbol, a pattern of 0 and 1 is uh, generated, and that pattern of zeros and ones is nothing but the corresponding code word so this is known as the code word so the symbol so actually uh, this has been uh, represented by so schematically i can show you so you have a discrete memoryless source we have already discussed the meaning of each of these terms discrete and memoryless so we have discrete memoryless source which can generate some arbitrary symbol say si and then we have some black box which converts a symbol into a patterns of zeros and one and this is known as let this be represented by say some bi and this conversion and bi is nothing but it's a pattern of zeros and ones so this conversion is basically done by means of a black box which is known as source encoder and while uh, making a conversion from si to bi that particular notion is always kept in mind that for any particular symbol if the information content is large then the corresponding code word this bi is known as the code word this code word should be having a higher length and on the other hand, if the information content pertaining to SI is small, then the resulting BI will be having a lower code word length. So this BI is not fixed. I mean, the length is not fixed. It can be four, it can be three, it can be five, it can be two. So it depends upon the information content present within that particular symbol that is SI. And this entire task is being performed by one uh, black box, uh, which is known as the source encoder. And uh, in this particular lecture, uh, we will be in investigating uh, two such important source encoder uh, for this particular application. Now, if I consider that uh, B1 for the symbol S1 is having a length of L1, B2, the code word corresponding to the second symbol is having a length of say L2, and BK, the code word corresponding to the symbol SK is having a length, say, LK. So from that, one can easily find out the average code word length because the code word length is not fixed. So average code word length which I can represent it by, say, L bar. So this average code word length is not the simple average. Since we have the probability associated with each of these symbols, so as you can understand, this is nothing but pi multiplied with li, where i is ranging from 1 to k. If the source encoder is capable of handling k number of distinct symbols. So the input to the source encoder is that particular alphabet that is curly s which can uh, generate uh, symbols like S1, S2, S3, up to SK with the corresponding probabilities of P1, P2, P3, up to PK. And for each SI, the corresponding code word, this code word is nothing but the pattern of zeros and ones to represent that particular symbol. It's known as the code word. And for each SI, the corresponding code word length is different. So it depends upon the length of the, I mean, it depends upon the information content of that particular symbol. The length of the uh, code word or code word length depends upon the uh, information content. So if the information content is more, then the code word length will be large and vice versa. So from that, one can easily calculate the average code word length, which is given by L bar 
and that is equal to summation i is equal to 1 to k pi into a line then how can you understand whether uh, the source encoder that you have used for your application is perfect or not so obviously there should be some uh, minimum value of this uh, average code word length obviously you will try to send the information from the transmitter side to the receiver side using minimum number of zeros and ones that that is your objective always because as you send more number of bits to transmit the information so the power requirement will be more from the transmitter end so therefore uh, our objective will be to minimize the average code word length as much as possible without hampering the requirement so the minimum value of l, l bar is the minimum value of this l bar or average code word length can be obtained from shannon's source coding theorem and shannon has proved that the minimum value of l bar is given by the entropy of that particular source that is h of s so we have discussed uh, the notion of h of s in the last class uh, what is meant by the entropy of any discrete memory less source and accordingly uh, one can uh, find out the efficiency so the efficiency is given by the eta efficiency of any source encoding algorithm is given by so this is the minimum value of l bar that is uh, one can write like l minimum l minimum by l bar in other words this is given by h of s entropy by l bar so eta can be less than or equal to 1 in case when l bar the average code word length equals h of s that is the entropy of the source so in that case efficiency will be a maximum that will be 1 and uh, this should be our objective to maximize the uh, efficiency of the source encoding scheme and if not the eta value is uh, less than 1 in which case the value of l bar is higher than h of s that is the entropy of the source now while we talk about the source encoding algorithm so let us try to identify what are the requirements source encoding algorithm what are the requirements the first requirement is that the corresponding code words should be uniquely decodable so we have a symbol like this si generated from the discrete memory less source so i would like to represent by this dms in short so which generates uh, this source alphabets so at any particular instant it can generate si and this is being provided to the source encoder and the source encoder output is nothing but the corresponding code word that is bi now this bi is transmitted over the channel so at the receiver end you first have a source decoder and the source decoder output is nothing but the corresponding symbol so while formulating any source encoding algorithm one must keep into mind that the source code words must be uniquely decodable so this bi is nothing but the code words as i have already mentioned so this is nothing but the code word so this code word must be uniquely decodable uniquely decodable what does it mean that if i have two different symbols like si and sj then the corresponding code words will also be different so in order to ensure that these code words are uniquely decodable i cannot have a situation in which case as we have two different symbols say si and sj and both of them will result in some bi so this is not permissible in which case 
so this is not at all permissible this is not at all permissible say i do have two different symbols si or sj at least two symbols maybe more than two and after uh, this source encoding operation is being performed uh, on each of these symbols si and sj if i get a code word that is bi and which is same for both si and sj then whenever this bi is being provided at the input of the source decoder then the source decoder cannot identify what was the actual symbol whether it is si or sj so in that case the code word bi cannot be uniquely decodable so this is a violation of source encoding property so the thing is that the code words must be uniquely decodable so if i have different symbols like si sj sk like this then the corresponding code words like bi bj i mean the patterns bk so they are different maybe the length may be same suppose bi and bj both of them are having a length of 4 bj and bk might be having a length of 5 it it might be possible but the patterns the 00101 cannot be repeated so one particular patterns of zeros and ones is for a particular symbol that is the first criteria uh, which you need to follow in source encoding theorem and the second one is that for efficiency uh, as you have already mentioned for efficiency the symbols with i have mentioned uh, this property already symbols with higher information are encoded with more bits that means the code word length should be large if i have two different symbols si and sj and suppose the corresponding probability if i write like this so p of si that is a probability of si is larger as compared to the probability of sj we suggest that i of si that is information content of i i mean si is less than i of sj the information content of the symbol sj then for a perfect source encoding the length of si i should not write si rather bi length of bi since information content is less here so length of bi should be length of bj so in which case you will find that the average code word length is minimum and is approaching towards the value of h of s so you have to follow that particular requirement that if i have different symbols with a different probabilities like p1 p2 p3 and so on having a different uh, information content like i1 i2 and i3 and so on then the symbols with higher information content are encoded with more number of bits and vice versa and vice versa so with this prerequisite uh, let us uh, discuss uh, what is meant by a prefix code so with this prerequisite i think it will be the time to discuss about the prefix code and the notion of prefix code so suppose uh, once again uh, i do have uh, symbols like s1 s2 up to say sk so these are the k number of symbols within the alphabet curly s and the corresponding say uh, let me take some arbitrary for example uh, let me take some arbitrary symbol like si and this si is being represented by si is represented by say this particular arrangement so let it be mi1 mi2 mi3 
up to say mi capital n where each of this mi uh, let it be so each of this mi1 mi2 so they belong to the set 0 comma 1 that means uh, si can be represented by 0 0 1 0 1 1 0 1 like this so each of these mi1 mi2 mi3 mi n they can be either 0 or 1 and n here is nothing but the length of the code word length of the code word Now this is the code word corresponding to SI. So the code word is being represented by MI1, MI2, MI3, MI4 up to MIN. So N can be 5, it, it can be 7, it can be 9, it can be anything. Depending upon the algorithm that you are going to use. And if I consider within a particular, so this is the code word MI1 up to MIN. Now if I consider a subset of the code word, so this is the code word MI1 mi2 up to say mi n now within this sequence if i can extract a sequence like this mi1 mi2 up to say mij if i extract one sequence from the upper sequence where j can be less than or equal to n. Now then this is known as the prefix of the code word. So this was the code word. This was the code word. And this is known to be the prefix of the code word. So let me give you an example. Suppose for any particular symbol SI, the corresponding code word is nothing but say 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this is the code word with n is equal to 10. So you have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. So any subsequence originated from the main sequence can be regarded as the prefix of the code word so the prefix could have been so there could have been different prefix the prefix could have been like 0 1 1 0 or i can also consider 0 1 1 0 1 or i can also consider like 0 1 so these are the prefix corresponding to that particular code word where j could have been the length of the prefix is either equal to the length of the code word or less than the length of the code word. So I can consider 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. So this is extracted from the upper code word or I can consider 0, 1, 1, 0, 1 extracted from this one. So this is known to be the prefix of the code word. Now, what do you mean by the prefix code? Now, prefix code is a kind of code for which if I consider two different code words, so for this particular set of symbols like S1, S2, SK, so you must have k different code words for each of the symbols. For S1, you should have like uh, say B1, for S2, you should have B2, S3, you should have B3 like this. And this is nothing but uh, your bi this is nothing but bi corresponding to so bi is nothing but a vector this is bi so for s1 you have b1 for s2 you have b2 for s3 you have b3 and so on but the lengths can be different it is not necessarily true that the lengths will be n always so it depends upon the probability of the occurrence so the prefix code is known to be a type of code for which if you have different code words like this b1 b2 b3 up to bk then none of the code word 
is a prefix to some other code word. What I mean to say is that I can consider a code to be a prefix code if if none of the code words none of the code words is a prefix of some other code word in the alphabet so then the notion of prefix code is violated if this condition is violated then the notion of prefix code is violated so let me give you an example so that you can understand uh, let us say that uh, we do have uh, say four symbols Say we have S0, S1, S2, and S3. And the corresponding probabilities, let it be say 0 0.5 here, 0 0.25, 0 point say 1 to 5. So I would like to make it simple, 0 0.125. You do have four symbols, S0, S1, S2, and S3, and the corresponding probabilities are represented by 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.125, and 0 0.125. Now let us uh, consider uh, different codes. Suppose this is code one. Another code, so let it be say code two. And another code, let it be say code three. Suppose uh, for code one, uh, let us assume that uh, this S0 is represented by zero, S1 is represented by say one, S2 is represented by say, say zero one, and suppose S3 is represented by say one one. For code two, suppose S0 is represented by zero, uh, S1 is represented by say, One zero, S two is uh, represented by say one one zero, and S three is represented by say. Uh, let us consider zero one zero, one one zero, and uh, let it be say one one. One and for say code three, uh, suppose this is zero, then we have say zero one for S one, for S two, uh, let it be say zero one zero, and say for S three, this is zero one one. So let us consider. these three different codes, code one, code two, and code three. So for code zero, for code one, S zero is represented by zero, S one is by one, S two by zero one, and S three by one one. Now let us try to understand whether code one is a prefix code or not. Now if you see the code word corresponding to S two, that is zero one, and the code word corresponding to S zero is zero, and code one corresponding to S one is one. So therefore the code word corresponding to S zero and S one, so they are the prefix. I can consider that this zero is considered to be the prefix of the code word S2. Similarly, this one is considered to be the code uh, prefix of the code one one. So obviously the code one is not a prefix code. Let me go back to the previous slide once again. A set of code is known to be a prefix code if none of the code words is a prefix of some other code word in the alphabet. So here already have seen that this zero, this is the code word corresponding to S zero, 
and zero is also the prefix of the code word corresponding to S2. Similarly, one is the code word corresponding to the symbol S1, and one one is the code word corresponding to the symbol S3. So therefore, here if I consider the prefix, this prefix is known to be one, and this prefix is nothing but the code word of S1. So therefore, this is not a prefix code. So our observation is that code word, code one is not a prefix code because it violates the condition of becoming a prefix code. Let us once again move to the, uh, the last code that is code three. 0 and 0, 1. Here you find that 0, 1 and 0. If you find one violation, then it is gone. So 0 and 0, 1. Obviously, this 0 is known to be the prefix of the this code word corresponding to symbol S1. And this is the this 0 is the code word corresponding to the symbol S0. So obviously, this is not a prefix code. You can also consider the second and the third. I mean the S1 and S2. So here 0, 1, 0 is the code word corresponding to the symbol S2. And out of that, this 0, 1 is known to be the prefix of that particular code word and which is nothing but the code word corresponding to S1. So therefore code one and as well as code three, code one as well as code three this is not a prefix code as well. Now let us consider the scenario corresponding to code two. What you find here for code two, it starts with zero, fine. Next you have S1 like one zero. So while uh, constructing the prefix, uh, once again, uh, perhaps you'll notice that the first element is nothing but this MI1. So MI1, MI2. So this element can be J, where J can be less than or equal to N, but you have to start from the beginning. So zero, fine, and here it is one zero. So obviously one zero and zero, so there is, uh, I mean the, corresponding condition of prefix code is not violated here. If I consider 110 over here, so from 110, you can have two different, uh, rather three different uh, prefix. One is one, second one is one one, and third one is 110. And 110 is itself, this one. So none of these, neither one or one one is a code word within that particular alphabet. Similarly, for the last one is three, it is one one one. So I can consider that code 2 is a prefix code because it satisfies the property of prefix code. So code 2 is a prefix code. Now, if the code is a prefix code, then it will be easier for you to understand. And for the decoder, it will be possible for the decoder to identify what was the actual symbol transmitted from the transmitter side. For example, if I consider code three, and suppose, uh, let us assume that the decoder at the receiver end, it receives the code word 010. So under this condition, it will be totally confused whether this 010 corresponds to the symbol S2 itself, or it is a combination of two different symbols like S1 and S0. Because if I just append the corresponding code words pertaining to S1 and S0, this will be nothing but 010. And the code word corresponding to S2 is also 010. So if the receiver receives like this, I mean, the source decoder, So source decoder, whenever it receives like 0, 1, 0. So there could have been two different possibilities. Either the 0, 1, 0 corresponds to S2 or it corresponds to S1, S0. So it cannot be uniquely decodable. So if the code is not a prefix code, then at the receiver side, one cannot uniquely decode the corresponding symbols. So that is the problem. On the other hand, if I consider 110 here, so you understand that 110 corresponds to S2. If it is 10, it corresponds to S1. So there is no confusion. There is no provision of confusion in case of prefix code. 
now uh, let us try to understand how does this uh, decoding operation take place actually in case of a prefix code so you have to start from a st starting starting node so it follows a particular tree which is known as a decision tree which basically portrays this uh, uh, entire encoding uh, algorithm so i think it will be better if i once again write it down for code 2 so we do have uh, four different symbols like s0 s1 s2 and s3 and let me write down the corresponding codes so for s0 it was 0 for s1 it was 1 0 for s2 it was 1 1 0 and for s3 it was 1 1 1 so how to decode so th there will be one initial state or starting state this is known to be the initial state i think uh, yeah initial state this is the initial state now this decoding operation is done serially one after another so first of all for this particular pattern so i know that there are four symbols 0 1 0 1 1 0 and 1 1 1 these are the corresponding four code words now you are at the initial state you know to identify the corresponding symbols so the beat pattern that is coming can be either 0 or 1 if i consider a pattern like this say uh, 1 0 1 1 0 1 1 1 0 1 0 like this so the first bit that is encountered by the corresponding decoder can be either 0 or 1 now if it is 0 so being at the initial state if it is 0 then it points to the symbol is 0 so if it is 0 it points to the symbol is 0 on the other hand it could have been 1 as well because you never know whether the symbol the corresponding bit is 0 or 1 now if it is 1 if it is 1 then you cannot identify a particular symbol because 1 is not the code word corresponding to any of the symbols so you will be here at a decision point so this is the starting state or initial state or initial point this is the initial point initial state initial state or uh, you can also mention like initial state or initial point so if it is zero if the bit encountered is zero then uh, the corresponding symbol is, is zero then once again if the symbol is detected once again the detector or the decoder will come back to the initial state now if it is not zero suppose it is one so in that case it will be over here and this point is a decision point now being at this decision point there could, could have been two different possibility either zero or one now if it is zero then one can easily identify the corresponding symbol to be s1 so one and then zero i think uh, i can change the color so that uh, one and zero so it's one now if not zero being at the decision point if the encountered bit is zero then uh, the receiver decides in favor of s1 but if not zero if it is one if it is one then once again one and one you don't find any code word corresponding to one and one once again you will be at a particular decision point now this corresponds to one this corresponds to one then once again being at this particular decision point if the next symbol or next bit is zero if the next bit is zero then you decide the corresponding symbol to be s2 and if the next bit is 1, then 
you decide the corresponding symbol to be S3. And this is all about the decision tree. This is zero, this is one. This is known as the decision tree. Let me explain once again. Or, uh, it, it will be better if I if I start with a, a pattern, for example. Suppose this is a receipt pattern. The receipt pattern is this one. Let it be say one one zero one zero zero one zero one one zero. One 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 zero one zero one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen. So uh, I am receiving one bit pattern of uh, seventeen bits. Now I have to extract the uh, decoder uh, needs to extract the corresponding symbol. So how to do that? So first of all, it will be done one after another serially, and the interdecision process uh, will start uh, from this initial point. So the first bit encountered is one. So if it's one, so the decoder moves along this line and from the initial state, it will come to decision point over here. But being at this point, none of the symbol is identified. So therefore, it has to identify the next bit. What was the next bit? That is one. So once again, from here, it needs to follow this path. Still, it cannot identify the symbol. Then it has to identify the next bit. What was the next bit? That is zero. So the next bit is zero. So it will give rise to S2. So corresponding to the first three, corresponding to the first three, the decoder decides S2. And once S2 is decoded properly, then once again, it will come back to the initial state. Then it will start counting from the next bit onwards. What was the first bit? One here. So it will come over here. What was the next bit? That is zero. So it will go along this path and S1 is detected. So the next symbol that is detected is S1. And after this one is detected, then it will once again come back to the initial state and it will identify the next bit. What is the next bit? That is zero. So if it is zero, so it points to S0. So in this way, the symbols are detected. So S0, then, then one zero, so one zero means S1, then one one zero, that means S2. So this zero means S0. Then one zero, then one one zero. That is S two. Then we have one one one. That is S three, and then zero one zero. So zero means S zero, and one zero means S one. So ultimately, the receiver can uniquely decode this code word. And it is nothing but S2, S1, S0, S1, S2, S3, S0, S1. So that can be done uh, by means of this decision tree. And this is only possible if none of the code words is a prefix to some other code word. So this type of detection is only possible for a prefix code. So if I consider, uh, uh, say, for example, if I consider, say, code 3, like 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 1, uh, you cannot identify whether it is for the 0, 1, 0, as I have already mentioned, uh, for code 3, if it is like 0, 1, 0, then you cannot identify whether it is for S2 or S1, S0 combination. However, uh, uh, detecting uh, code 3 might be easier to some extent. but even for this, this is not possible 
there is one uh, important observation uh, that you can uh, have from the code three is that for each of the code words uh, pertaining to this uh, code three, it starts with zero. So zero, then zero one, then zero one zero, then zero one one. So therefore, uh, to some extent, uh, it might be possible to identify, but uh, even for the zero one zero, it will be difficult. It has to check. Uh, for example, uh, if I consider a bit pattern like this, say like uh, say zero. Zero one zero zero one one zero one zero 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 one. Suppose this is the beat pattern and for code three, and you have to identify. So to start with the uh, this zero corresponds to S zero. That is fine. Then zero one. This zero one corresponds to S one. But then you have zero and another zero and one and one. So now there will be a dilemma whether you consider this zero one zero together as S two or you select. Zero one as S one, and this zero as S zero, and then this zero one one as S three or not. However, uh, this particular uh, code is having an advantage that the detection process will start from the bit zero, because here you find that irrespective of the symbols, whether it is S zero, S one, S two, or S three, irrespective of the symbols, always. The corresponding code word starts with zero. So if you find a zero, then only you can understand whether this is the beginning of any particular code word or not. However, uh, there will be a problem in this particular case. However, if you consider code one or code two, here you see that uh, the code word, the corresponding code word, might get started with zero, or sometimes it might get started with one also. As you see, for code two, it starts with uh, zero for S zero. And for S one, S two, S three starts with one, and for code one, it starts with zero uh, for S zero and S two, and it starts with one for S one and S three. So unless and until this uh, these codes, I mean code one and code two, they are until and unless they are a prefix code, then you cannot uh, uniquely decode the corresponding uh, symbols from the received uh, bit pattern. So that's why uh, detecting code one and code three is difficult. Code three follows some uh, some kind of uh, pattern in some extent that uh, uh, the corresponding symbol starts with uh, zero. So if it is the beginning of any uh, code word, then it will start with zero. Otherwise, not. But however, uh, detecting code one is uh, completely impossible. Even if you detect, then there will be some error in detection. Instead of detecting, uh, say, suppose uh, the received symbol is like zero one. The received code word, and instead of uh, detecting it to be say S two, you can detect it like S zero S zero S one combination. So instead of detecting S two, you are detecting it like S zero S one. So it is an erroneous detection. So it will be difficult and impossible for any uh, detector uh, to uh, detect uh, codes which are not prefix code. So uh, with this, uh, I, I would like to uh, conclude today's uh, discussion on. The prefix code, and in the next class, uh, I'll be uh, talking about uh, two special kinds of prefix code, and the construction and the corresponding algorithm pertaining to each of these.